Hello, welcome back to our tax class here in week 11, where we're continuing on with chapter 6. This is uh, Monday, March 30th, and by, t uh, by the night, tomorrow morning, uh, of course, your VITA basic certificate is due to be able to turn that in. We went through that last week on how to access that. So if you haven't done that, be sure to get that done as well. Uh, in a couple more weeks, we'll have the advanced portion, where the advanced portion isn't that much harder, I don't think. It includes a few items from um, examples from today's lecture with depreciation, but not a whole lot more that I've found that was much harder with the advanced. So let's just go right in now to, I'm on page of our class notes where we left off on depreciation here on page 12 of my chapter 6 notes. I also have my uh, book open here in chapter 6. And primarily to the, the back section on page uh, where the tables are, starting with page 6-44, where we're going to have depreciation tables. Okay, a couple key terms that we need to get clarified right away is the difference between personal property, real property, and personal use property. Three different terms that um, especially the personal property and the personal use, I don't know why the tax law decided to use those two such similar names because they can get to be very confusing, especially when reading about it uh, in the book. Personal property, of course, that sounds like it's your own item, that you own it for your own self and it's not part of a business. But that's not the case. Personal property is actually part of the business and depreciates. Something that you actually use on your own is called personal use. So very similar names, but drastically different in the way they're done for tax purposes. For tax, you can't do anything with personal use property. For uh, business stuff, you can, and that's called, unfortunately, a very similar name, personal property. Um, <clears throat> we're going to be using the MAKERS. That's what this stands for, MAKERS, uh, Modified Accelerated Cost Recovery System. If you've had Accounting 101, MAKERS is the most similar to double declining method. In that, with the double declining method, if you did 101, you basically do two times whatever the straight line would be. Uh, makers is very similar. We're going to be doing twice what straight line would be and also using the continual book value of the asset instead of the main purchase price like the straight line is. We use the same amount every year with double declining and with makers, you continually go down. But the good thing with the, for tax purposes, they give you the percentages to just use. Whereas in with double declining, you have to, to figure up the percentage and then times that by the book value. Don't want to get too much into that. But with, um, as you'll see in just a little bit, we'll go through some examples. The percentage is already given to us and they're right there in the book. Um, with, uh, with tax purposes, Items already have a useful life that is determined for you, unlike with gap accounting in your accounting 101 days. With a gap accounting, you can specify, this is how long I'm going to use the asset, therefore that's the useful life or the estimated useful life. For tax purposes, they tell you what the useful life is for a certain type of asset. Most of your uh, computer and those kind of equipment or automobiles or um, there are a few other things, but a lot of those are five-year lives. Most everything else is seven-year lives. If you see any type of furniture or furniture or any type of machines and equipment, those are going to be your seven-year life properties. Those are the main two. That's why I only listed two of them. There's there's more items. If you and there's um, a graph or a chart that shows you that in the book some of the different ones, but these are by far the most common useful lights for personal property items, things that are used in your business. And then the two common items for real property. Real property is anything like 
buildings, any type of building, whether it's a warehouse, something you use for business purposes, or it's residential building, were used for rental purposes mainly, or yeah, I guess that's pretty much what the residential you rent. Uh, those two have the following useful life. Always, it's going to be 27 and a half years. Why 27 and a half? I pretty much, I'm guessing you, you know how the Senate and the House works. The Senate probably said, I think it should be 25. The House said 30. So they took the middle. Again, I'm not positive on that, but that makes, that makes uh, logic sense to me. Uh, the 39 year life for any assets that is not residential use. Um, <clears throat> you're gonna, again, I always want you to read through all of my notes and I'm gonna try to hit the, the highlights. So when I say use the table percent in the back of the chapter, that's what starts on page 6 44. And, uh, half year convention, uh, quickly tell you what this means is, even if you bought your assets, say, January 1 or February 15th, it doesn't matter for tax purposes. You're assumed to have bought it at mid-year. So you can only depreciate half. And the tables take that into, take that into play. So that's why when I say down here, um, if you look at the five-year property on table 6A-1, page 644 on the textbook, You'll notice a five-year property actually goes down six years. And that's because the first year and the last year are half years. So the, uh, that's why there's a sixth year there. It's not a full six years. It's a half of the last year and half of the first year combined. So when you see for a five-year property 20%, that's actually half of what the full, if you would have counted it for a full year at 40%, which makes sense. If you have a five-year property, um, if you would do it evenly, like straight line, that would be one year out of five is 20%. So double that with double declining, and which is similar to makers, and it's 40. But then again, tax law says, well, for the first year you have it, you can only count half, no matter when you bought it. So that's where that 20% comes from. And then this is going to be key, too, in some of your homework problems. When you, if you happen to sell the asset before the useful life is up, say you sell a five-year property in the fourth year, what you're going to do is take whatever the value of the property is and multiply it by that 11.52 um, percentage that's there in the book and then cut it in half. Because in that last year, no matter when you sold it, it's treated as though you had it for a half a year, no matter if you had it for almost an entire year or just a couple days. So we're going to see that here, and I'm going to explain that here in a couple examples. Okay, so with this example D, we bought some equipment. Notice this is office equipment. So the first thing we have to do is go back up and look at what is office equipment. And anything that's furniture, office type things, as long as it's not specified as computer or any of those peripheral computer type items, um, we're going to usually call this a seven year property. So what I want to know is if we bought it on, um, in May 2014, what's the depreciation going to be for 2014, 2015, and then assuming I sold it halfway through the year or a little over halfway, in 2016. So what we need to do is look at the seven-year property on page 6A1, on page, six, page 644, table 6A1, seven-year property. So what we're going to do is take the value of this piece of 4,000 and times it by the 14.29%. We don't have to cut that in half. The first year is already cut in half for us. So that's simply what I did. Let me pull up my answers. 4,000 times the 14.29%, 572. The next year in 2015, we just multiply it straight across. And then it's that third year in 2016 when we get rid of it during um, partway through the year. 
we're going to need to take the 4,000 times what they give us, 17.49, and then whatever that answer is, we have to assume a half year, even though it may be more or a little less, and then divide that answer, whatever it is, divided by two. This, this 17.49 is assuming you had it for an entire year, but we did now, with example E, the warehouse, the warehouse, that's a, a non-residential item. That's going to bring us to the table um, on page 6-48, down at the very bottom, 6A-8. Down there at the very bottom, it says depreciation uh, for a 39-year life and a warehouse would be a 39-year life property because it's non-residential real property. Real meaning buildings. So in this, with this type of method, notice they do it per month. And therefore, they don't cut it in half by years. They cut it in half by months. So what we, with the first year laid out for us, they've already cut that in half. If we ever sell the building in between the first year and the 40th year, then we have to go down to that 40th year and assume that that's the year we're in. Because the 40th year, they've gone ahead and cut that in half, too. So we'll see that in a second here. When we get down to the, the year that we've sold it, we need to go down to num year number 40 and assume that that was the last year of its life. So 300,000 bought in August of 2014. So we're going to look at table 6A-8. First year in the month of August, the eighth month, I got 0.963. That's a percentage. So it's not even a whole 1%. So we're simply going to take that decimal and then multiply the value of the house or of the building. The second year, all the way through year 39, if you have it for that long, you're going to multiply by that 2.564%. Every year after is going to be that $7,692, except the year that you sell it, if you do sell it early, and as we did in this problem. We sold it in July of 2016, so what we want to do is go down to year 40, over to the seventh month, because that's the July month, and use that percentage, 1.391. And that's how we get our depreciation then for any year that we sold the asset. It's actually a lot easier. It's, it's pretty easy when you have the chart and you just go to the bottom year. You don't have to cut it in half like you did on any five- or seven-year properties. For example, B. This mid-quarter convention, what this is saying is for tables, this is where we introduced the tables um, back on page 644. Table 6A2, 6A3, 6A4, and 6A5 are all part of this. This is saying uh, for tax purposes, they don't want you to try to jip the system and purchase a whole bunch of items in December and then take a whole year right off on all of those, even though most of them you bought at the very end of the year. So what they say is if you bought more than 40% of your assets, not including real property, in the last quarter, then you have to use these four charts. And what you have to do is split up your assets for that year into which quarter you purchased them. So it becomes a lot messier. So any assets you purchase between January and March, you would use table 6A2. Third, uh, April to June, 6A3. And third quarter and the fourth quarter is going to use the 6A5 charts. So if we were to look at my little example here, in, in uh, example F, we bought three machines and they're all seven-year property. The total of all of my assets was 8,300, but over 40%, this is over 50%, you can tell just by dividing, by looking at an 
half. Well over 40% was in the last quarter. So therefore, I can't use the regular five um, half year convention table 6A1. I have to break these down into the quarters that they were uh, purchased in. So the $1,200 property, I would look at uh, table 6A2 because that's first quarter. And I would take 1,200 times 25%. And then August 12th, I would look at table 6A4, that's third quarter, take the 1,500 times, notice it's a much lower percentage, 10.71. And then for November 5th, only 3.57%. Here I have it laid out. You can actually see it. And what the total maker's depreciation is for the year. So this method is only used if you buy over 40% of your assets in the last quarter. Sounds a lot more pain. Okay, now. What a lot of businesses take advantage of are the next two sections to avoid a lot of depreciation calculations. Even though computers do them, they can still get to be kind of messy. So what they ought to do is, as much as possible, write off the entire asset year one. Now, in GAAP and accounting 101 rules, that's, you can't do that. But for tax purposes, to make things a little easier, tax law says, um, we're going to give you a break, and we're going to allow you to depreciate some items right away. And you don't have to um, depreciate them over the year, yearly life. We're going to give you a set amount, and if you are under that, you can depreciate all of your items right now in the current year. And then they're, they're valued at zero, and you don't depreciate them the rest of their time. So with this bonus depreciation, <clears throat> if you bought a brand new asset, brand new, not just new to you, so it can't be a, you go and buy a used car for your business. So if you bought a brand new asset, this is the government's way of helping uh, manufacturers uh, who make stuff and then sell new. This is helping them out. They're giving you a break the business if you buy from these guys new. They're going to give you a tax incentive because that's to help uh, make more business and make people work, more jobs available if there's more people buying. So they're saying up through the end of 2014, this current tax year, it was extended. Um, we can you can take right off right off right off the, uh, right off the bat 50 percent of your assets value. So if you bought a fifty thousand dollar item for your business. You could take twenty-five thousand off right away, and then depreciate the rest of it over the maker's life. And so that doesn't necessarily help in the for the maker's department, in that you still have to calculate depreciation. Where it does help is lowering your net income. And the lower your net income, the lower your tax expense will be. So bonus. And your regular depreciation have no limits. They can they can cause your net income to go below zero and have a net loss. A net loss is, is okay for tax purposes in that not only do you not pay any taxes in the year that you have a loss, you can take that loss back two years or forward many years and get to write off some of your income for future or past years and therefore reduce your tax liability in those years. We, we don't discuss that, that's beyond the scope of this class. That's corporation style, um, more corporation type businesses, so you would look at that in the next tax class, in the, uh, the accounting two, uh, 208 class. <clears throat> okay, so let's see how this works here with a 2014 purchase. We purchased a machine, five-year life. 
we're just, I'm just assuming, I'm just giving you this five year life for 12,000 and then we get rid of it in 2016. This is how we would have to go through and depreciate. We would say, all right, out of the 12,000, I can write off and depreciate 6,000 of that right now and I can then take off another 20% using regular makers. Going back to that um, table 6A1 on page 644, five-year property, 20%. So you take whatever's left of the asset's value after you depreciated it half. That's where I got the 1,200, add them together, and we would be able to depreciate $7,200 in the first year. And then it just goes on the same way. You're going to use 6,000 as your new basis for the property and multiply it by the percent given. And then, that, of course, the last year you have it, you have to cut it in half. Half of whatever the makers is allowing you. So if I wanted to know how much the asset was worth when I'm getting ready to sell it, you see if I have a gain or a loss, Whatever I sold it for minus the book value, 2304. So then I have you do that there in example G. You can look that up in my answers and see how well you did. And I would, I would do that. I'm going to pause the video, pause it, and work through that one and see if you do get the answers. Okay, the next special tax little rule and something that's um, out there and very beneficial up through at least the current year, 2014 tax rules. Hopefully it'll continue to get extended for business purposes. But what this does is even in some ways it can be better than bonus because you get to write the entire asset value down to zero and expense it all. Therefore you don't have to do any makers. And it, But there's a couple little um, bad things about section 172, well, section, section 179 as well, and I'll, I'll hit those in a minute. So this is for, again, complete depreciation of the entire asset, and it doesn't have to be new, brand new. It can be, even if you bought it from it uh, used, you can still do a section 179 and depreciate it entirely. And then the order that things are done, you take 179, whatever you can first. And then if you run out, then you do the bonus next. And what I mean by run out, as you'll see in a minute when we talk about the limits, there's, you can't just start depreciating everything and reduce everything down to zero. With bonus, you can take up to 50% of all of your new assets in the limit. There is limits to 179. <clears throat> okay, so for the... Uh, Section 179, notice here how much you can write off. If you bought assets totaling $500,000 or less, you don't have to depreciate any of it. You can just, you don't, I should say, you, should, you don't have to depreciate year by year using makers, any of that. You can just write it all off right now in the year that you bought it, as long as it was less than $500,000. Now, you can't, if you bought... Now, the, another limit, though, is if you bought under 500000 no problems. If you bought over $2 million in assets, then there starts to get to be a little bit of a problem. The government at this point says you have a lot of money available to you. Therefore, we're not going to give you nearly as much tax incentives. So if for every dollar over the $2 million that you um, spend on new assets, a dollar for dollar gets taken off of the 500000 that you're allowed. So again, you're usually a route to write off the first 500000 So if you bought a million dollars in assets, you could write off 500000 of those right now and not have to depreciate those over the rest of their life. But if you bought over $2 million, then every dollar over $2 million, you don't get the first 500000 You get a dollar less for every dollar you're over the two million. <clears throat> so therefore, once you've reached 2.5 million in assets purchased, you don't get any section 179. You can do the bonus or makers and that would be your only options. Notice here, 
what happens to Section 179. The 500,000 that you're allowed this year in 2014, as of the rule is written right now, if there's no updates, that 500,000 drops all the way down to 25, 25,000. That's a big difference for a lot of mid-sized companies. And the ceiling, the $2 million ceiling of, of what you can still deduct all of it goes, drops all the way down to 200,000. That's a very big um, difference. A couple other limitations. So you have a dollar amount limitation, 500,000, cap of 2 million. The section 179, the other, more of a big limitation is it can't drop you below zero for any losses. So in, in, and you always do depreciation last when you're calculating your expenses. So your depreciation expenses, if that's your last thing, and it, it would always be, you can't use Section 179 to make you go below zero. You would stop at zero, and then you could take uh, makers and, uh, and go below zero, have a net loss, but nothing else. Um, note, there's a page in the book. I believe it's page 614, if I remember correctly. But you are allowed, if you have a loss coming up and you're going to get down to zero from business, if you have or your spouse have wages from other jobs, you can use those wages as income, as counting as income in your business, and therefore continue to drop your, um, your business net income by using those wages from your job to offset your Section 179. Um, depreciation. There's one multiple choice question I know in the book at least that has that issue. Or even though you may have $10,000 of net in, of income and you have depreciation, section 179 is say 15, normally you'd only be allowed to take 10 of that 15. But if you had wages say at 40000 then you could take all of it because your 40000 pushes you way above it. An income, and you can you can take you can absorb all of that deduction. Notice then, if you can't use all of your Section 179 because of the limits, because of those five hundred thousand dollar limits, or because of or, no, excuse me, because of the net loss limits, not the five hundred thousand, but because of net loss reasons, you can't deduct it in this year. You can carry it forward and deduct it next year, or all the way. So whenever there is no uh, limit, and then you can also, as I said, take bonus or regular depreciation, even though you're down to zero with Section 179, you can use bonus to take you on down further. <clears throat> okay, so with this example, example H. Net income five hundred eighty thousand, and we purchased new asset eight hundred thousand. How much depreciation can I claim in the current year? Notice I only have five hundred eighty thousand depreciation or income. Now, a key thing to remember is you the eight hundred thousand. I can't depreciate all of that with section one seventy nine. Remember the limit is five hundred thousand. And I definitely didn't get, hit the two million, so I'm okay taking all five hundred thousand. So how this is going to play out? So for section 179 depreciation reasons, I can take five hundred thousand, write it off right now. So now I'm down to three hundred left that I still can depreciate. And if this was a new piece of equipment, which I believe I said it was, yeah, new, then I can take um, bonus and say, okay, of the 300 that's left, 50% of that I'm going to write off as well. So now I'm only down to 150 that I have left to depreciate. And since this was a five-year property, I look at the, the maker's table there on 6A-1 and take another 20% and depreciate that in year one. So in total, I've got a huge depreciation expense that I can use, $680,000, which makes me have a net loss of 100000 and that's okay. 
just as long as my Section 179 didn't cause me to go below zero. And it didn't. I had 580 and I only used 500. So it wasn't Section 179 that caused me that loss. Now, in example I, everything's the same, except now instead of our net income being 580 before depreciation, our net income is only 300,000 before depreciation. Therefore, with Section 179, I'm limited. I can't use all 500,000. I can only use up to the net income, 300. Now, notice the, the new basis is still the same as up here of 300 because I'm assuming that I'm going to go ahead and carry that 200,000 in the next year. And as long as I have income that can absorb it, then I'll have an extra two hundred thousand to take off, which would be a good I would be a good a good thing to have for the following year. So I'm going to take a little bit less depreciation now in hopes of being able to use a big chunk next year. So I assume that I'm using all five hundred thousand, even though I'm only I can only use three, the other two is going to be used next year, hopefully. But for basis purposes I assume that I used all five hundred. So 800 minus the 500 is where I got 300,000 remaining. And then just like what we did in the example above, bonus and makers. Total depreciation less the 300,000 income, net loss of 180. One other example. This one we have back to our original net income. The only difference now is instead of having $800,000 equipment, $2.3 million of equipment. So now we've hit the upper cap. And we've gone over the $2 million by $300,000. So we have to take a dollar for dollar off of that $500,000 um, Section 179 allowance. So if I'm over by $300,000, i got to take $300,000 off. That leaves me with $200,000 left of section 179 and then the rest I do with the other methods. So I'm all <clears throat> uh, with example J here I'm I'm left with only two hundred thousand left to depreciate with section one seventy nine. So my asset for depreciation purposes is down two hundred thousand to two point one million. Assuming this was still a new asset, these were all new asset dollars spent. 2.1 million times 50%, add that in for depreciation, and then makers for what's left of the asset's value at the 20%. Okay, just a couple more minutes and then we'll uh, wrap it up. Listed property. If something is considered listed property, and one of a couple of the main items would be a cell phone, um, and vehicles are especially in that category. Listed property is generally items that you use for both personal and business. And the main one I can always think of is uh, phones. As long as you use it for over 50%, then there's nothing really special to do about the item. The only thing that's different is if you only, if you use your cell phone seventy percent for business, then you can only depreciate. You can only expense seventy percent of your cell phone's bill, and that's kind of the same with anything. So you would have to go through and look at all the numbers that you called and see how many were personal, how many were business related, and figure out the percentage, and then that's what percent you could deduct of your bill. With vehicles, there's a table, and on page six, seven, page six dash seventeen, and they tell you how much you're allowed to depreciate per year. Okay, so basically, they consider a luxury automobile anything costing over fifteen thousand. Which, even if you bought an automobile that's fifteen thousand, it's not necessarily a luxury in my opinion. It's pretty much a normal. Normal cars cost about that much, so that 
that was just me doing calculation. There's nowhere it actually says that, I don't think, in the book. But with doing some of the calculations, that's what I came up with. So what you do is you use regular makers with these automobiles. <clears throat> you can use a bonus. But notice they tell us here that bonus, and if you read in the paragraph, it tells us what the bonus is. If you read right below, there's a, a little table there on page 6-17 where it says auto limit and light truck van limit, year one. These limits apply to section 179, the 50% um, bonus and regular makers. And they were reduced even less. So that 3160 in year one, if you don't use the car for business purposes 100% of the time, then that 3160 goes down by the percentage that you use the vehicle. So if you used it 70%, you would take 3160 times 70. And that's the max depreciation you can take in the first year. take off this part because this is no longer in effect. I'll have to update my notes. Let's see. Okay. Example K. I have to update some of my answers to yeah. the the amounts went way down for what they usually are, at least in the book. In prior years, you were allowed to take up to 11000 because of the bonus. This year, not so much. You're not allowed to do that. So year one, with this asset here that I'm buying, let's say you know, we bought a $32,000 automobile. We're using it 75% for business. And we have to take, if we can, anything we bonus, whatever. So if we took bonus on a 32000 that's going to take us up to 16000 in year one, and we can only deduct $3,160. I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to look this up, but I think that $3,160 does not include bonus. Um, it seems like a, too big of a difference between last year and this year. That will be one thing I do want to look up. Uh, if you have, I'll, I'll update my notes once I do, and I'll look that up. If I, if I see it's a big deal, I will let you know. But for the, for the most part, we're going to have to use what the table says here on the book to answer any questions. I don't think there are very many questions in the um, homework about this. So I think I'll leave it at that. Just know that you'll need to, if you ever depreciate an automobile, there are limits. That's basically what I want to get out of this. There are limits, and I don't know that the book limits there are exactly correct because I do not believe they take in the bonus the first year because bonus was just recently extended at the very end of the year in 2014 before this book was even published. This book was published in October of 2014 and the bonus was extended near December. So obviously the book wouldn't have it and I don't think those tables include it. Actually, right, so I think I'm going to put back on my notes that those vehicles are allowed that extra amount, assuming that the book and the table, the tables in the book are incorrect. And then just a couple things on the homework, and I uh, I put these in the uh, blackboard as well. Number twenty one, even though the asset says it was the book says it was sold on January one, that's kind of confusing. Pretend that it was sold March fifth or any other date throughout the year. It's just basically making sure you know that if it's sold at any point in the year, you, you can use a half a year for the deduction of depreciation, not a full year. And then number 32, it's not clear at all, but when they talk about repairs, assume there are repairs to the whole house. So therefore, you can't take dollar for dollar acting like it was a direct expense and it was just for your home office. 
it's for the entire house. Therefore, it's an indirect expense. All right, that wraps it up for Chapter 6. Remember, there is a discussion board on uh, VITA and the importance of it and why does the IRS do this service. Uh, the regular Chapter 6 homework here due by April the uh, 5th, 6th, 7th, I believe, Tuesday, by our normal date.